What's up, everybody? This is Carrick with ACG, and as always, it's my continuing mission to bring you reviews that aren't two minutes long or filled with sponsored bullcrap. And today, I'm stoked to bring you the review for Battle Chasers Night War by Airship Syndicate and published by THQ Nordic. Battle Chasers is out October 3rd on the PC, PS4, and Xbox One for $26.99. Now, Battle Chasers tells the tale of Goli and her five combative compatriots as they travel the land solving mysteries using violence in their stealth airship. So it's pretty much like Scooby-Doo, except replace Shaggy with Nolan the Wizard and Scooby with a giant armored to the gills golem. Let's see how this three-on-three turn-based dungeon crawler did, shall we? As always, if you like the video, eh, maybe subscribe. So here's my review for Battle Chasers Night War. Almost no battles actually occur at night, not dying from getting gut punched by 21-ton golem, and the legalities have taken nine-year-olds into battle. Graphics are up first. You know, Battle Chasers really does nail it in a couple parts, like the comic book style art that it takes from its source material and the excellent but lightly animated overworld map with its almost oil painted look. But the main heroes as well, let's be honest, not a single one is really unique in the scheme of fantasy games. Wizards, young protagonists, knights named after something inherently militant or giant robots with bird friends. But it's all done relatively well and the enemies pass that same test. Interesting, but not ultimately very inspired. Even their version of the famed Mimic treasure chest looks somewhat like, well, a Mimic treasure chest. In many ways, that is a testament, though, to good solid work that doesn't elevate any one part. And while I appreciate adhering to the level state of the art itself, not much really pops here. It looks good, but that's pretty much it, except for the animation. It's not necessarily excellent or even well framed, but it's in the telling that you see the execution. From the gear up of the War Golem's minigun to the way Nolan spins the fire above his head before sending a fire tornado aloft. It's those momentary bits of respite prior to the attack that I adore. It's like someone yelling, this is right before the violence. Take a picture because nothing's gonna be the same afterwards. There's an excellence in the understanding of hesitation right before action, and it's a great before and after picture, really. And every character has this, and while you're never truly amazed when someone stabs someone else with a giant sword to cause bleeding effects or sends a five-foot-long slivered piece of ice into the abdomen of a wolfman, it always looks really good. And there's color work as well that I was really appreciating here. Again, it's a bit of an artistic touch from the comics, but it looks great. I adore the overall color of the world, and as you traverse the overworld, its changes, while not gradual, do alert you to the moment you're moving from the verdant pastures of the safety and calm of a town into the dried out and almost deserted woodlands that shelter all manner of bandits and places to hide. And while all the character attacks have elevating series of different animations, one special note is that the burst attack, which is basically a charged up meter you build as you battle, looks great. And while no particular spells overstay their welcome, and this isn't Final Fantasy summons level by any means, it's nice to see a little eye candy here as a reward for a battle well planned, at least up until that point. Also, the game's dungeons are really well done, and while inherently based on a tile system with some random generation when you repeat them, each one's atmosphere is pretty much dramatically different from the one before it, and that really does help whether it's the first time you've suffered through a castle or the fifth as you try to get through it on legendary difficulty. It's good stuff. Now, on the PC, the game offers very few options for different graphical choices, but you will hit 4K at 60 FPS with this or last generation's cards and a pretty good CPU to match it. If anything, it's not demanding. While the console sees a typical 1080p resolution, they also see a number of crashes to the console's main screens, which require reloading of the game's last save. This isn't exactly inspiring confidence, especially because sometimes after loading, you can actually see an FPS drop on the consoles that crop up. Hopefully we'll see a patch past the one that was put out today. As a package, I dig it. I would have loved more idle animations or different ones or more suitable I'm hurt and I almost am ready to die kind of stances. But what we get is fairly well done within its range and good solid work. Sound, music, and voice. And of course, let's do music first. This is pretty good. It's typical fare with big thundering moments when you expect it, and more sedate and ambient tracks when exploring the game's overworld or trudging through a dungeon set inside of a blasted out beach resort. It's pretty good, and the instrument choice does a fairly good job aligning the overall feeling of what's happening on screen with what you expect to hear and see. And there are a couple standouts like the percussion heavy track or two that you get during battle. 
And I got to admit, I usually love Jesper Kid's tracks, but something about this reminds me much of how Night War itself reminds me of things. And that is that basically everyone said, okay, this is good enough and moved on without running anything through that polish and shine filter that you would expect when excellence is also appreciated. Overall, I'd say it's good, but sort of forgettable. Voice. Now this is not bad, but it does suffer from the typical atypical, hey, we're pretty good with our voices, only to find out that most of the game is text after the couple few times you meet people. This always hurts me as I end up feeling like the game's front loaded and really enjoying the audio representation only to find out that everyone's just going to pull out their LG phones and friggin text each other, though they're standing one foot away. Cutscene voices are well done, but as with everything, there's not as many of them as I would have liked. Sound. This is pretty good, and while not needing to be atmospheric to inform the gamer, it's not that kind of game. There is some good processing effects for echo and reverb, which can really add a serious audio punch to a whirling fire tornado or a 12-year-old's last attack with a pair of punching gloves that look like they were created for Rockbiter, that giant bicycle riding stone golem in the never-ending story. From fiery to the high crystalline sound of ice breaking over an enemy's face, it's all done fairly well. It's nothing to write home about, though, but it does its job. If anything, I would have liked more environmental sounds, both in and out of battle, because many of the locations look interesting and busy, and aside from a few lean environmental effects, they actually don't have sound that really represents that. Gameplay. And of course, a bit about the story. Now, some of your friends and you, adventurers gathered together over Battles Pass, are cruising around in your airship only to be attacked and spread out over the land. You start with three heroes and find three others on your way in this turn-based dungeon crawler as you pretty much bash, beat, crush, punch, puncture, smash, slice, slash, skewer, and shock everyone in the game world who is foolish enough to be on the trail in front of you. At some point, you'd think that the bad guys would just create a system of communication to warn everyone that a group of three people who've killed literally everyone in the game world is coming and to maybe go have a burger or something while they pass by. Now, while no one is particularly special here, they're all pretty good when it comes to the combatants. Take, for example, the bounty hunter slash rogue Red Monica, or the wise talking Nolan, who's a 500-year-old wizard far past his happy-go-lucky days and in probably need of a walker versus actually walking around, and team them up with Gully or Garrison or others as you sort of go out, choose your battle structure, and then beat the hell out of everybody. Now, each character has a class-based skill. This grows as you level up. Additionally, each of them has a dungeon power that can be used a number of times, like healing the party or sprinting through traps. That's not a huge bonus, but it is interesting and useful. As you're leveling up characters, you can also pick perk points, and these go between two different skill ability trees for each character. Now, the main part of the battle is based on turn-based and status effects. So you have things like bleed, sundered, and so forth, and different characters can attack normally for super heavy damages, usually or mix and match statuses to damages. And as battles progress and enemies and friends alike collect statuses like the world's unluckiest Magic the Gathering cards around them, then those hits can get stronger and stronger. It's a wickedly well done system and it entwines your basic moves with your powerful ones, especially since those powerful ones are also initiative weak, meaning you trade off taking a 500 pound fist and gut punching this wolf creature right in his baby makers so that you can sit back and watch your action order drop a bit, but all because you're spooling up to destroy him with a minigun that rivals anything in the Predator. Now, battles based on initiative and moves and items that adjust it can be hit and miss in their strategy. But Lord does Night War absolutely hit it, and it's especially when it comes to, of all things, mana. Because there's only a few ways to replenish them outside of potions in the game, but that's okay, because if you're worried this would feel like that first day back at school after summer break where you have everything in your pack, here there's an elegant solution to play across a presentation. Overcharge. You see, when you attack someone with the basic attacks, they cause overcharge, which is like someone crawling out onto your trunk and pouring some gasoline into your tank like Mad Max, and it works like a friggin' charm because you actually can't spam those attacks and willy-nilly skip off to the extra battle with that extra mana, because that kind of temporary boost actually leaves between the battles, and it has this tremendously successful feeling of push-pull in the dungeons, because do you want to push on in the hopes that you can live through the first parts of the next attack and then get some temporary mana built up so you can drop some colored attacks on enemies like an entire tricks box just exploded, or do you give up, leave, and maybe come back with more supplies? And this isn't the only cool thing because you also have a burst attack, which is team based and not, let's say, like overcharge, which is sort of a specific character that's creating it. This is team built and team based. And some of the effects are wickedly overdone, like Gully's pulling up a piece of the earth and just hucking it at the enemies. This keeps battle at the very least somewhat varied and gives you a lot of different options on how to play. Another thing that helps it is the game has over 120 enemies, all with various special skills, just like your own, and they can pull those off in the midst of battle. And the more you fight them, the more you're gonna learn about them. 
For example, an enemy may show up and it just has question marks above it. It looks like an Eye of the Storm globe you bought from Radio Shack in, let's say, the 1990s. It's evil, but not really scary. And then it launches a series of flash attacks that screw with your initiative and hit incredibly hard. But if you face off against a number of them over time, you start to get bonuses for fighting them. This helps with a problem later in the game with the layout that I'll discuss in a second. But I love this system and I felt like the pawn system from Dragon's Dogma was a good, easy comparison between the two. And while some troubles are here, not so with the robust crafting system. You see, not only can you create a huge number of items throughout the game, there is something here that I really love, and that's the fact that you can try to create something even if you don't have all the ingredients, but the chances go down. But even more interesting, if you have too much of an ingredient, you can throw that on there because as we all know, when you're making a cake, more sugar just makes everything better. And your chances of creating epic versions of normal items by just throwing a bunch of extra crap on there really does add a level of detail. We've all had that moment in game when we wonder, why in the heck am I carrying 256 pieces of jade, 14 werewolf locks of hair, and 11 boxer briefs from assorted bad guys, if they're only used in seven recipes? In many ways, this crafting system of Night War does away with a good deal of that and makes almost everything at least feel worthwhile before you have to decide to get rid of it. But unfortunately, Night War suffers a heavy misstep, especially since the way the game plays, you're stuck with the problem. As you progress, you unlock a couple of additional heroes, but you only take out a total of three. That's okay usually, because you know how it is the moment you have four or five in a group, the world just ends. But unfortunately, those heroes don't level up, which can also sometimes be okay, but you're forced to tromp over the land, taking out random creatures to level them up. And for a game all about war, it's actually a little bit minimalistic when it comes to the monsters. Also, there's another problem. In dungeons, there's magic boxes. You can throw an item in the box, teleports to another part of the dungeon, but also levels that item up inside it. It's like creating your own treasure, which is awesome. It's friggin' cool, really. But if your peeps aren't there, then you can't choose their weapons and equipment to do it. And there are a couple other instances of things like that, leaving Tom, Dick, and Harry hanging out at the local bar, telling stories about the group of friends they have who are off adventuring and smashing epic bad guys in the mouth while they sort of run things at home. And lastly, while the game has a fishing element, it feels incredibly tacked on, even with upgradable poles and lures. It's just a push button affair and something about it feels like it was added at the last moment. Like somebody saw a bullet point and was like, oh yeah, forgot, fishing game. Also, while the game's long, it's over 20 hours, it can get a bit repetitive, even with a fast travel teleport system that you can use to bounce around the world. And while it does its best to keep it going with story and new character introductions, by the time I was done, I was actually well and truly done. Fun factor. This is actually a great deal of fun, but it does tail off in that last fourth of the game due to the repetitive nature and the oddity of its later leveling systems and some other various idiosyncrasies. And even on Legendary in those dungeons, with intelligent use of the crafting system, you can end up absolutely thunder punching your enemies into oblivion in the later game. So as you guys know, I rate games on a buy, wait for sale, rent or never touch it again rating scale with deep, deep sale replacing rent on the PC. This is a good solid title, but it is a wait for a sale. It's got an intriguing number of little systems that actually work really well in battle and dungeons that while not necessarily always a delight to descend into, they were interesting nonetheless, but it's hurt in the very categories it also tries to excel in. It's solid, but it's brought down by a somewhat bland story. It's intriguing systems start to feel a little off during the later game repetitiveness and it's dungeons while able to be set at a different difficulty once you beat them the first time and having assorted puzzles that can be interesting. They're all impacted by the odd leveling of characters. In the end, those issues plus the odd technical glitches that we saw really makes this a wait for a sale for now. So I hope you guys liked the review. If you did, give it a thumbs up. Maybe check out Twitter or become a patron. If you disliked it, give it a thumbs down. And always remember, if you want to sponsor YouTube on the YouTube gaming side, you can go there. There'll be a link in the first post and in the description. Peace out and enjoy the rest of your week.